Hello. I'm Piers Corbin from weatheraction.com, long range weather and climate forecasters. And we're here today on Friday, April the 27th, for our regular monthly weather action meeting to discuss, first of all, the fact that climate change is on now, and secondly, some scientific papers that have just appeared. And on the real live climate change happening now, we're going to point out that, for example, when we talk about climate change, in real terms, it means the jet stream moving around. And it's only us who can forecast the jet stream moving south or north. The other theories around don't explain any of that. And in the course of that, we'll talk about the very cold May, we're expecting still. And under the second part, discussion of some entire scientific papers, we're going to talk about, well, the delusional work of Chaco Natal in nature and the uh, confusion of cause and effect by Svensmark in his paper about galactic cosmic rays and their influence or not. Science. Right, we're going to talk about two scientific papers recently published. The first one by Chacon et al. in Nature. I called it a 3D paper because it was dishonest, delusional and dangerous. Now, it beggars belief that this stuff can pass peer review process. Uh, which really points to the corruption of the peer review process. First of all, we present the actual facts, which are undisputed. Namely, that at the end of an ice age, first of all, the southern hemisphere warms up. Um, and then, uh, afterwards, late on, uh, through the few, few thousand years it takes to warm up, the northern hemisphere warms up. And measurements of carbon dioxide show that the carbon dioxide comes out of the southern ocean as it gets warm and increases. So the warming southern ocean drives the carbon dioxide out of the sea. Now later on, the northern hemisphere gets warmer and it takes a while. Now why that happens is not completely understood, but it's probably something to do with the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream takes a while to switch, and when it does switch, whoosh, the whole upper part of Arctic gets warm. Now, what these gentlemen did was they took an average of the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere and plotted it out, and we are plotted it here, this is simple, and said, wow, look, look, carbon dioxide average comes before the world average temperatures. Therefore, carbon dioxide is causing the warmth. And this is complete insanity. Complete insanity. It means that the Southern Ocean knew in advance that carbon dioxide coming off itself was going to cause it to warm 100 years, no, sorry, 800 years before, before it warmed. Before, before the CO2 came off. This is the utter madness, right? It just can't work. They're playing around with averages in order to trick the public. This passes as science in nature, the top world journal. Now, if this carries on, it will be the end of science. I think the Enlightenment never happened, or those guys just don't believe it. Okay. Well, that is Shackleton. The other one is by uh, Svensmark. He's been promoted as well by uh, Nigel Calder. Now, I just do want to say that I've got the greatest respect for Nigel Calder, who's a science journalist. And his father, Richie Calder, who was an inspiration to my parents for what he stood for, which was, you know, well, a world without hunger, among other things. I mean, he was a really great guy. And Nigel Calder is equally great and is... is you know, science reported. However, on this one, he's wrong. Now, Svensmark is a good scientist, and you can talk to him, and he will talk. 
But I have to say, what they're putting forward does not work. Now, Sven Smark, I met him, he's a good guy, and, you know, he's doing a lot of real science. Um, and I don't believe he's setting out to deceive people, unlike Shakun et al. Okay? But what he's saying doesn't stand up. Uh, his basic argument is, he says, that galactic cosmic rays cause climate change in view. They modulate temperatures. He says that, um, which is true, that when there's more solar activity, there's less cosmic rays. And when there's less solar activity, there's more cosmic rays. And those cosmic rays, he says, will cause clouds. So, therefore, it's going to be cool. Okay. Um, now, you can see a graph for this. What I've put is... Um, Solar activity goes like this, and the cosmic rays then do the opposite. Fair enough. And temperatures, however, do not follow the 11 year cycle. They do a little tiny bit, but it hardly shows at all. What they do follow is a 22 year magnetic cycle. Now, the cosmic rays, which are monitored, measured, if they're doing what he says, you've got to have an 11 year cycle in world temperatures. But you do not. Therefore, it must be a direct influence of the sun. The cycle you do see is a 22 year magnetic cycle. So the temperatures go something like this. So they do sort of agree with his theory half the time, but the other half of the time they don't. Now, how does he get this across? Well, what he does. His reportage, although he gives very good graphs showing that the cosmic rays move oppositely to solar activity, when it comes to doing the temperatures, he plots a smoothed solar activity in terms of what he calls solar cycle length. And it's called, I'll read it out, he said, remarkably good correlation with the smoothed curve of the varying solar cycle length. Now, there's been a lot of arguments about his measurement of solar cycle length, but he uses that as a measure of activity because the shorter ones tend to be more energetic. Okay, what's well, that? But I, I think it's a completely stupid measure. Why not actually measure it itself, i.e. the geomagnetic activity and so forth? But, you know, that... But that enables him then, of course, to do a moving average of solar cycle length. Okay, well, you could just smooth out this problem of the 11 years, and you find if you take 22 years or more, then, well, it's true that I'm at the, because the main, main thing happens in the odd part, then you will see that the length will change of that average thing according to this theory. But the details do not work at all. And if they don't work, the theory is wrong. Now, if you want to look at the facts, the reason why they don't work is the actual flux of energy to the Earth from solar particles is 300 times that from galactic cosmic rays. So there's, there's no chance that galactic cosmic rays can overpower the sun. It's a nonsense, a complete nonsense. And it's unfortunately brought about by a trick. Now, I don't like using the word trick because that's normally reserved for global warmers. Let's say an inaccuracy. Now, the most, the next step that Sans Mark has done, and this is very nice stuff. You see these beautiful pictures. Wow, you see the Pleiades. That's nice, isn't it? And what he shows, he says, look, if you have, when you've got periods of more supernovae, that is explosions in the galaxy of other stars, they're going to give more galactic cosmic rays hitting the Earth, it'll make it cooler. And he shows graphs to show when there's more supernovae, the world is cooler. Because that's what his other theory says. However, the other theory doesn't work. 
So how can this one work? Uh -huh. This is what he says, supernovae, if you, and these, you get more of them when the Earth passes through a plane of the ecliptic or a spiral arm of the galaxy. Um, gives you extra, extra, more galactic cosmic rays, gives you cooling. All right? And there's a correlation, you can see it. But what's really happening, for every extra supernova, there's extra dust in the galaxy around that region. That is why they happen. Dust is there, so they form. Okay? So, and there's dust between here and the sun. That causes the Earth to be cooler. You can't argue about that. It will be there. It will be cooler. More dust means cooler Earth. End of story. More dust means more supernova. End of story. So, they come together. Here we are. Dust causes cooling Earth. Dust causes more supernova and extra galactic cosmic rays. So, they come together, but they are not connected. They're not causally connected. They're connected statistically, but one does not cause the other. They have a common cause, which is dust. Piers, just to interrupt, why does uh, extra dust cause supernovae? It's, fine. it's not obvious to me. Okay. What, what they look at is star clusters and their development. And when there's more dust, they develop quicker because the dust goes into the star. So stars can form when there's more dust, because stars form from dust. So that is just the region. It's as simple as that. Or put another way, the regions where there is star formation are where there's going to be dust. dusty. Yeah, must be. Absolutely must be. And empty space where there'll be less dust between Earth and Sun will be. You'll have fewer supernovae. You'll have fewer supernovae. Yeah. Like in in, in that general be... vicinity of the galaxy. But you're still going to have a lead period of what, a couple of million years up before dealing with the most massive stars. Yeah, 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 of course. But you see, that they, they look, this is undone very long time scales. Oh, they're not talking thousands of years here, we're talking we're millions, about yeah, climate change over yeah, millions absolutely. of years. It's very slow climate changes on the planet. In fact, the graph here, which goes on, is typically, the time scales are between the peaks of these events, 100 million years. Back to oh, right. So, you see, it's very, very slow. It's entirely different from the other stuff. We're talking about five years. Okay. But he says it's the same mechanism. The 100 million year thing actually is, could, could be spiral arms, but it's also argued, and I do remember this because this was an exam question I did at MSC uh, in astrophysics at Queen Mary College. It was, you've got the solar system and the plane of the galaxy, and if the uh, galaxy, if the solar system is above the plane of the galaxy, then it's going to get attracted towards the plane and it will go through it and get attracted back. So there's going to be an oscillation of nothing but the plane of the galaxy. And you work it out with figures and you can get, could be 100 million years period. And this is, see, no, this is. It's not to do with the, it's to do with the rotation of the solar system around the galactic system. Right. Well, that is also there and that goes through the spiral line. So that is there too. So which is it? Well, you just have to try and work it out from diagrams. But the, the, the bouncing up and down thing might be nonsense, but it, you, know, you can get the right figures from that if you want. The climate theory put forward by, by Spencer Mark is, is nonsense. However, there's something very interesting and important in his findings, I think. Namely, that you know, there was changing things happening on the Earth when we had these colder periods and more dust and also more galactic cosmic rays. Now, it would seem to me that that ought to be studied, and that is an important finding, because the galactic cosmic rays come in all sorts of very high energy particles, which will cause mutation of plant cells, and therefore more rapid evolution. So that is the really useful and exciting finding that we put forward. So, now you might ask, well, why are we hearing about all this now? Because, you know, and why does it get past the uh, peer review process in the Royal Astronomical Society? Well, you can understand the Royal Astronomical Society, and I'm not a member of it, like anything that talks about stars, space, planets, fantastic. So, you know, they like it, even though it's wrong. But there's another dimension to this, namely the... Uh, Warmest are 
promoting Svensmark like hell in order to smash him down, which they found easily. And then they say, it's not, because they believe that is the solar theory of climate change. Oh, it's not the sun, it's not these cosmic rays and all that stuff and the sun modulating them. That doesn't work. It's CO2. That's what they're up to. And Svensmark is the foreground. Now, I'll defend him absolutely against the attacks they've made on him, which are just vicious stuff in his early days, because he was saying it wasn't CO2, right? Just like they attacked attack me. But, you know, we defend his right to do the science, but point out the wrong aspect of it. And I think we'll hear a lot more about this on the... Uh, in public debates and on TV, but I can be very sure the BBC will not be inviting me along. Newspaper time. We had superb coverage on the front page of the Daily Express. And it's accurately reported what we said, and within the article it explains we're talking about the eastern part of the country. Now, the Daily Express carries a lot of weather stories. Mostly these are ignored by the other newspapers. But other newspapers took this one up. I think it was because it's from us. And the other papers, the other things the Express carries are often not accurate. However, rather than try and give an honest reportage of what we said, certain other newspapers, I would say, were deliberately dishonest and provocative. The Independent phoned me up, well, basically to start a rap, you know, um, and you can read what was said, uh, if you enjoy that sort of thing. Um, and the Telegraph, I mean, I thought she was just asking questions to check, which didn't seem to be the case, because what she printed was different from our forecast. I mean, she did not explain we were talking about the eastern part of the country. And furthermore, she put us as long-range weather forecasters in inverted commas. And she said that we were different from others because we were using the sun, as if I you know, couldn't do that. And then she said, by their nature, long-range forecasts are inaccurate. <laughs> now, therefore, of course, we were inaccurate. However, that is liable because we have a proven record of success. Furthermore, the fact that we use solar activity is why we're not inaccurate. What she should have said is, long-range forecasts done by traditional methods are inaccurate, but Mr. Corbyn's are reliable to a statistically significant level. So, but anyway, you see, some of these so-called quality newspapers do not meet their own standards when it comes to certain reportage. Whereas, you know, whatever you might think about the Express and the Sun, They've always quoted me accurately. But some of the quality papers, no. They do not quote accurately. Because they have an ideology they want to project. And the sun, well, they just want fun. And the express, well, you know, it's a headline. So why not be accurate? Why not? Thanks for coming. To summarise four things. May. In the United Kingdom, especially Easter parts, will be exceptionally cold, probably the coldest or near coldest for a hundred years. The last coldest was 1996, and then there was snow in northern parts, and on one occasion there was actually snow in the South Downs. So that sort of thing could happen again, but certainly we'd say a lot of hail. Cold blasts, not a pleasant day at all. Second thing is, there'll be more detail of this available for you, and there really is for subscribers to the full detail forecast on the web. And we'll report things as they develop during the month. Next point is the summer. We slightly delayed the final production of the summer forecast because of these very interesting developments. But they will be available very soon. They're normally available uh, some months earlier than this. <clears throat> Our work on earthquakes is exciting and continuing, 
and has shown really remarkable correlations between earth-facing coronal holes and major earthquakes, especially when we are the earth-facing coronal holes that we predicted. And lastly, of course, in the coming month and months, watch the scientific debate in the World Astronomical Society and on TV. Thanks. Thank you.